Okay, welcome to Microsoft's DevSync for October 9th, 2020. Uh, this is the end of our first week of Sprint 16, I believe. And um, we're, uh, we're just going to go around and check in on uh, progress, any, especially noting any blockers or things that are keeping you from getting your work done, any surprises, that sort of thing. Um, we'll start off with Derek today. Yeah, all right. So I've been mostly working on um, things related to the uh, boards that we've got in, in process, uh, the 25 um, new SJ201 boards. Um, so I'm getting, um, so I got, uh, if you guys check the team chat on Mattermost, I posted some images. I finally got that first um, 3D printed design put together and I've got now a list of things that can be improved upon for the next uh, re revision, so I'm working on that. And then um, there's some additional parts that Michael requested that I got ordered. Um, and yeah, just getting things moving to be ready to put those together. So that's, that's basically what I've been up to. I don't really have any blockers. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, any questions on that? We can't post images of these just yet because of, um, uh, well, just to be totally frank about it, we're going to be filing for a uh, design patent on the design. And this is to protect uh, not just ourselves, but all of our users and community uh, from uh, unofficial knockoffs. We fully intend to uh, offer all of these files as open source files for people to use. Um, but that doesn't uh, mean that we don't have to still protect our intellectual property from abuse uh, and people, you know, basically purporting to be micro, purporting to be things when they might not be quality controlled and all that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so yeah, so finding the, uh, the right balance there between, you know, absolutely being an open source company, uh, but also wanting to make sure that people get uh, stuff that actually works uh, is, is, you know, why we're, we're, we're doing this right here. Uh, why we're not releasing the images right now. So just FYI for all those out listening. Um, let's go to uh, Getz. Oh, but wait, there's one There's one thing I, I should bring up. Um, so one of our top uh, contributors <coughs> in the community uh, pinged me on Matter Most and had some concerns about the, the V1 camera. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to I'm gonna chase that down and, and we might end up looking at a, maybe some other options. Yeah, I saw the V2 camera being offered for sale in at least one place for the same as what I thought you were saying the V1 camera was, was quoted at. I think it was like 10 bucks. So yeah, there might be right. some more, uh, more things to chase down there. Yeah, he said the performance between the V1 and the V2 is substantially better on the V2 and that there's some limitations to the V1. And, um, you know, I think the reason we were considering the V2 or, or not considering the V2 was because we are possibly thinking about building it onto our own board. Um, you know, if we don't do that, then we don't have that concern because it has this kind of, um, uh, I guess, Raspberry Pi built in a system that kind of identifies that this is a Raspberry Pi V2 camera. Um, so if you try and build it your own, it, it doesn't identify correctly or something like that, if I recall. Um, but yeah, if we're buying it off the shelf, we don't have to worry about that. So right. I'm going to look into that. Okay. How good is publishing meetings online? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I've been focused a lot on Lingua Franca. Um, uh, but I think we're now going to um, do a one more V0.2 release um, with uh, just with a few fixes and that sort of thing, um, and then do the refactor as as version 0 0.3, um, just so that, you know, in case anyone does want to stick on the old version, then they can. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a breaking change or anything. So um, it should be fine. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's looking really good though. Um, you keep finding a few little things to tweak, but um, we're getting getting very much closer. 
Does that um, right now tests? Yes. Automated tests? It does, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of, lots of tests. Uh, Lingua Franca would be an absolute freaking nightmare if it didn't have tests. Um, but also, like, not just tests on the, on the, you know, the, the language methods, but also tests on, you know, some of the internal methods as well. Yeah, but um, jump in and if you, if you uh, game, jump in and have a look and comment if you think anything's missing. Um, but it, it's a gargantuan change, so it'll, it might take you a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, what else has been going on? Um, uh, the the log thing is working well. I've I've just got some logs from um, from a PR that's that's thrown the uh, the stop errors that we haven't been able to nail down. So I'll take a look at those. Uh, and um, oh, and uh, I've I've been doing some recording with one of our community members, uh, Steve or Stratus. Um, uh, basically. He, we were going through some home assistant stuff and, and he's like, can we just record the meeting so I can look back at it? And and then we were like, well, why don't we just, you know, make these publicly available? So um, we've done a few um, sessions and, and going to package those up as, as things we can put out there, which, you know, at first just go through really simple things like getting Microsoft set up in a development environment and, you know, setting a specific version of Python if you're, um, you know, if you're running something different on your local machine and uh, and then we'll get home assistant set up and well not not the setup of home assistant stuff but the common IOT framework and um, anyway we'll, we'll see how it goes there and uh, and I was even thinking that you know we might go through the, the lingua franca the new structure of lingua franca um, and that kind of thing um, because you know we we want to have written documentation for all that but as I'm sure everyone knows, lots of people would just prefer a 20 minute video on something than reading pages of text. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of trucking along in the background. Okay. Very cool. Um, I was just looking at your tickets and, uh, the Wolfram alpha issue. Uh, do you have, uh, are you being blocked on that? Do you have the key? That you need to make that work again. I do not. Has that okay. been resolved? Uh, it should have been resolved. I've just pinged Johnny to see if uh, he can get you the new key. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so let's go to Ken next. Just an aside, I, I think that's great, Gez, because that's part of our corporate culture, right? We're very transparent. And I think these meetings and those kinds of meetings, hosting those are just, they set us aside. And throwing that chip on there also sets us aside. So I think that's great. Uh, it's been a busy couple of days. Uh, let's see, so I reviewed your patent. Uh, I looked at it and my only comment was that the, anytime you say optionally or alternatively, you're probably talking two patents. So the irreversible versus the cipher, I think, kind of splits it into two different patents. Uh, but that's just my two cents. I'm not an expert on that sort of thing. Uh, I verified that the uh, SJ201 code that I produced works on the other SJ201. What's odd is that one doesn't play anything out of the speakers, but I can plug the line out into headphones and hear it, even though the i2c volume isn't showing up so i thought that was interesting that i'm still getting audio out but i can test so that's good uh i submitted a bug fix for the current image we have uh it has to do with a timing uh issue regarding the mess the gui message bus on on buddha uh so probably better than half of the time it won't work because it won't get a connection to the gui message bus because it's there before the gui message bus is ready and then it just stores none and then for the rest of its life it says none has no method called send so the pull request that i gave you that you closed uh had that bug fix that's in that interface.pycode 
But um, as you saw as well, it pulled in a bunch of stuff, and that confused me. I was, I mean, I took it from the Kibbe display branch, like you told me to, Chris, um, and it, it got a bunch of other stuff besides my meager fix. So I don't know what's up with that. And I don't know how we're going to get that bug fix communicated or actually put into the code, but we should probably do it before we cut another image. Uh, I'll leave that to you guys. You have the code. Um, I Char submitted Charter raised a minor stink on that PR too. <laughs> What's that? I said Jarvis raised a minor stink in that PR too. I've been communicating with him. He's an interesting fellow. He's the guy from Portugal. Um, he's he's really bright and he's nice and he's very helpful and uh, I really appreciate his input. Um, he forked our, our code, nothing wrong with that. He's got a uh, code that can do things ours can't. So he's like, well, why don't you just put that there? And I'm like, I'm looking at the code. It doesn't do that. Oh, that's on my fork. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, so I formally submitted the SJ201 uh, pull request. Thank you, Chris, uh, Chris Gez for uh, reviewing it. Uh, it's in your uh, it's in your court now, Chris V. I, I saw you got back to a couple of notes on that. A um, couple of issues came out of that uh, that I'll bring up just briefly. One of them was I named that subdirectory SJ201 underscore rev A. Chris was thinking maybe we could name them after the board revision. Um, my pushback on that was that I, I just wanted to call it SJ201. The only reason I even put Rev A was that I'm, I was hearing that the next board may behave differently. But my concern is if we start naming them after board revisions, there could be five or six boards that all work with the same software. So I'm not sure how to address that exactly. Um, that was the first issue that came out of that. So I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'm ambivalent. I'll name it whatever you want. Uh, We're not really going to go backwards either, are we? Like, we're never going to. Once we move past the board, we're not going to go back and start using an old version. So well, I wonder if it's even necessary. Uh, yes and no, right? Um, the Certainly none of the prototypes we're ever going to go back to, right? But we could very well release something for the dev kits, for example, which is the first set of boards that we, you know, we're going to produce in any kind of uh, large quantity. Um, and we may find that there's something that we want to tweak before we go out and start making 5,000 of them uh, for, you know, for filling the, the Kickstarters and whatnot. Um, you know, it might be something as simple as, uh, oh, hey, we're changing our, maybe we find a way to implement the DPI interface instead of the DSI interface, and that saves us 10 bucks on the display, right? Um, so most of it will be the same, but there'll be a little bit of a software tweak on the display side, right? Um, so yeah, so I think you know my ignore my thing. It'll, it sounds like it'll be rev a until until things are out in the wild, and then we need to make some kind of real change. So ignore me. Yeah, right. I, I, then, you know, I, I understand the confusion and the and the, and the concerns there, and I, I do appreciate Chris V's uh, uh, thoughts about tying it to specific hardware revisions. Um, and I think that's actually something we we should pursue a discussion of because uh, right now we don't actually have the ability, as far as I know. Uh, to identify which version of the hardware you have by querying the hardware itself, right? Uh, and that's something that we need to develop. Um, and yeah, uh, and that's the first thing that I don't want to get lost in this discussion is I, I'm not a not a fan of naming things after uh, parts. <laughs> um, you know, we, we probably shouldn't be naming anything SJ201 if we can avoid it in the code. I wouldn't think, um, but. Well, well, the enclosure it's, uh, code would make sense, I think. But yeah, let's have a discussion about that. Um, because we do have the ability to uh, to put custom code on the boards that we can read so we know exactly which build it came from and which you know even which lot it was produced in and that sort of thing. Well, I'll simply, re I'll simply parrot my response to the comments. I'm ambivalent regarding the naming. Just update the ticket with what you want and I'll do it. Uh, the second issue that came out of that review from Gez was, uh, and, I, and I noted it in the comments, obviously, uh, that I chose to use 10 of the 12 LEDs for the volume, and there was a method to my madness, um, the, not the least of which was it was the easy way out, right? So, you know, uh, if I increase volume one-tenth with an up and decrease it one-tenth with a down, and I turn on 10 LEDs, it's a really easy mapping, right? Uh, 12 is a pain. I don't care about that. That's just math. 
the the real issue there was that I'm anticipating somebody at some point in time saying, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had a lead dedicated to the mute slider so that we knew if the microphone was muted? And maybe somebody might say, gee, on the old versions of our hardware, it had an indicator lead that showed when it was listening to you. And so I was assuming that somebody might want at least a couple of LEDs available for other functions than just showing volume going up and down uh, that were somewhat consistent. Uh, and, and again, I don't know that it's that big a deal. I can refactor it. So I'm just pointing out those two things were there. It's not blocking us or holding us back for anything. And uh, once we solidify what the uh, interface and functionality should be, I can go in there and pretty easily change it to handle anything we want. So it shouldn't hold anything up. I just wanted to point those two things out that were brought up during the review. <coughs> Uh, I reviewed some pull requests. Uh, I reviewed some database schema with Chris V, which looked really good. Um, I talked with Chris about, as you guys probably know from previous discussions, the LEDs uh, that we're using require pseudo access for two of the modules that come from the Adafruit library. And um, so I figured out where to put those in our setup. And I had mentioned to Chris, maybe we just replace the section that says re-speaker with that. And then Chris, you had some input on that. So why don't you uh, share that? And, uh, and just to finish up, the other thing beyond that is that I started on the VK tests for the tagger. The first couple um, of levels are very simple. Like I uploaded a sample, uh, it was valid. Did I get a valid response? I uploaded one with a bug, did I get a bug response? Anything beyond that is going to be challenging because of the disjointed nature of the processing that's going on behind the scenes. So I can't say, hey, I just uploaded this uh, to there. Let me now pull it in the next request for wake words, right? Because we don't know what the algorithm is going to produce. We don't know when it would actually get moved and processed into its formal location, probably that midnight. So some of that stuff is going to be a challenge. Uh, but the initial... VK stuff, I, I should have the first couple of tests banged out by Monday. Thank you again, Chris V, for your input, because I was blocked until I spoke with him. But Chris, why don't you share the issue regarding pulling the re-speaker stuff out of the uh, setup? <clears throat> yeah, I was just worried that um, how many people, we've been kind of touting the re-speaker uh, dev kit for a while. I don't know how many people out there have got re-speaker uh, Mark twos, big face Mark twos, um, that we need to or want to support. So, um, you know, just like the you know SJ two hundred one different versions. Is, you know, I, I don't know what where we stop with, you know, these older Mark two uh, OTC or OTS versions, and what we're supporting and what we're not. So, if, you know, if we want to. Be able to support um, older OTS versions with the re-speaker array on it. If it's worth really replacing it, or if there's worth, you know, giving some sort of option that either you're using a re-speaker or you're using the SJ201. And beyond that, all you're doing in that piece of code in that setup script is you're flashing the one-channel firmware onto the re-speaker board, right? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's a good point on. We don't actually know how many people have built those because we kind of put that call to action. Hey, guys, we've got got these plans now. If you guys want to go build your own. So maybe that's worth investigating um, to see how many people out there have actually done that. Well, which, think, which setup group are you talking about? Like, well, the, the question is, are we moving forward going to support the re-speaker build? I guess is the simplest way to put it. I think we'll continue supporting it on Pycroft, for example. But I haven't <coughs> released anything. Well, the image we have right now, the Kivi image I have right now, is basically the re-speaker image. We, have ne we haven't Obviously, released the I Kivi image. I modified it for the SJ201, but it is a re-speaker image. I We've mean, never released the Kivi image, so you can do whatever well, you like. I get, the Kivi image. I get that. The question is, should we? You know? Oh, well, yeah. Or we, do we, we want to support yeah, yeah. it moving forward? I mean, but I just mean, know, we, we haven't released it, so you can change anything at the moment and you're not breaking anything like no one's no one's using kiwi on respeaker except for us 
Well, I guess let me, let me phrase it a different way. Uh, and I don't know that this is where Chris V was going, but this is where I was going. Does it make sense to freeze the Kivi display build or image that Chris V has created, go and rename it re-speaker, take the changes I've applied on top of that for the SJ201, create a new Kivi image called Mark II, right? I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying. Because otherwise, you're, throwing, you're technically throwing away work, right? Because it does support the re-speaker pretty well. Uh, yeah, We're I mean, my, my opinion is to delete the old images, um, and if we can put something in the naming convention so that we know, you know, which hardware it's it's built to support, or you know, have a change log somewhere, then then that's good. I mean, I think uh, if we, um, yeah. To be clear, I'm talking about we're talking about the uh, enclosure Mark II repo, um, um, right? I, I don't know what the repo is. It's it, what you know. It's core. It's what you. Oh wait a minute. So because I get I get confused here. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the Mark II repo. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, yeah. The core so the part for the uh, for the boot up. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I guess the real question then is: Is anybody using because that repo is public? Is anybody using that repo to build um, older re-speaker versions of the Mark II? And if they are, do we, you know, do we cause issues with those people? Are you talking about the Mark II Pi skill thing? Or no, the enclosure Mark II repo that's got the recipe for building a Mark II image. It's got an auto run .sh script in it. What we're talking like... about is that there is a flag, a file that's put on the image called first run in home, or actually in root. And, no, it's not in home. And the first time <coughs> you boot up your device, it checks for the presence of that file. If it's there, it deletes it and assumes it's an initial setup. Now, that's where I would place the code to install the two root required or uh, elevated privilege required modules. So there would be a pseudo pip3 install these two libraries there. Right now, there's code to flash the default firmware onto a re-speaker array. So that's technically what we're talking about. But from a higher level, we're kind of talking about do we want to continue to support re-speaker builds um, because maybe there's a lot of people using it? Right. Um, <clears throat> I think that that's, a, uh, that's an excellent question. I don't think we can resolve it right here. Uh, philosophically, I'd like to continue to support something that we've been supporting for uh, some reasonable period of time. And whatever reasonable is, I think, is going to depend on how many people are using it. Um, if it's, you know, uh, if it's 100 people, then, you know, we should support it for maybe three or six months. If it's uh, two people, then like you know, we'll send them an SJ two hundred one, right? Uh, it'll be cheaper. And get we're all seen card. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, yeah, so I think we just need to find out how how many people have built those those devices, um, and that'll that'll tell us how much support we need to give them. Uh, but you know, it should be noted that the SJ two hundred one, if people want to get a similar experience uh, to what they're getting with the respeaker. Uh, you know, we should have the SJ201s available as a standalone part, uh, along with the dev kits. Um, so uh, at some point in time, and um, and so, you know, buying one of those will totally replace the the uh, the re speaker and give you you know total compatibility with everything else that we're doing. All right, and just to <coughs> chase, at a technical level, the new build will not work until that line has been inserted at that location in that file. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my question is just, just, should there be an if statement there instead of, uh, you know, the checks for something rather than replacement? <laughs> yeah, you know, I wasn't really seeing that. That's something that surprised me too. I wasn't seeing like a hardware identifier variable in there. I have yeah. seen it in other places that says like Mark II, like in the enclosure code. But I wasn't seeing that in the auto run script. Am I missing something, or is it just not in there? Hey, uh, this is an important discussion, but this isn't the right place for it. So oh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's. Uh, uh, I don't mind problem solving a little bit, but if it if it drags on, then we should we should really punt it to you guys talking offline, or you know, uh, make a All ticket right. about it. And, 
Uh, you guys obviously you're welcome to get together whenever you want. And I encourage you to do that constantly. Um, uh, yeah, but with everybody here, you know, let's try to keep it okay. a little more focused. So, so thanks. Right. Though. Yeah, that's it for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ken. Um, so, uh, Chris Fair. Yeah. So, as Ken alluded to in his update, um, he and I had a discussion yesterday about um, the the database schema. Um, so I did implement the database schema as we talked about it before with one change. Uh, basically, we talked about having a derived table that um, delineates all of the quote unquote final tag values. So once we know that, that uh, hey, Mycroft wake word has actually been determined to be a Mycroft wake word, then we put that that final determination on a separate table. So that makes it easier to determine, you know, whether or not we need to, well, from my point of view, whether or not I need to um, bring that file back up for more tagging. And from Ken's point of view, um, you know, what he can bring into the training, um, you know, for different things. And that, that we think that will help us with some performance um, instead of traversing a table that has every single tag everyone's ever done. <laughs> I'm um, trying to find out, you know, which ones are, are correct and which ones aren't. Uh, so that is now a part of, included in that schema. Um, I have a branch now of Selene for the tagger. Um, I have the I basically stubbed in the API. I did all the database work, um, and I am now working on the API call. Probably the hardest part of this is going to be the API call that says, what do I send um, to the UI? What, what files you know, do I send to the UI and, and what tags <laughs> um, do I send? So um, that's going to probably wind up being a pretty nasty SQL statement. And I'm kind of working on that right now. On the other um, hand, that's the fun part. Yes, yes. It's the more challenging part. I, I, I welcome a good challenge. Um, everything else has, has been pretty easy up to now, so it's just taken a while. Um, so that's what I'm working on. Um, I also, as you mentioned, I started to look at Ken's PR, but I have not finished looking at Ken's PR. Um, I just kind of started that before the meeting, had some time. So, um, so yeah, that, that's where I am. Um, so my progress really depends on how long it's going to take me to figure out. There's like seven or eight tables that hold this information. So writing this query, um, you know, getting that right is going to be a big deal. So we talked about um, last time, I think, uh, just implementing a query, right? As long as it could be, you know, a simplistic uh, query, it doesn't have to be totally uh, perfect in terms of like giving you the optimal answer, but as long as it gives an answer that could be roughly considered correct, uh, just to implement something and then get on with implementing the system as a whole, right? So that, you know, we can present the user with a bunch of choices and they can actually you know, tag them and that sort of thing. Are you still going to go that approach, or are you, are you trying to solve the? Yeah, the I'm not trying to solve first? a huge problem, but I need to know if it, if it, you know, if, it, if it's been final tagged or not. I need to know, um, you know, what tags it, it, it um, you know, I need to know what tag needs to be done for it for a file versus what the, what doesn't need to be done for the file. So there's, you know, some of that logic needs to be in there. But yeah, I'm not going to get crazy. I just want to make sure that I return something that doesn't it actually needs to be tagged, <laughs> and. Um, I don't know if there should be any, you know, um, any randomization in there as far as, you know, if we have five different tags. Mm -hmm. you know, well, now that's a good it. segue to my question, which is <laughs> reproducibility, because I am jumping into VK tests early next week head, head on. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you a term that you may or may not be familiar with regarding testing. It's the concept of a clean versus a dirty system test. So on the back end, uh, and let me just explain it technically. Typically, if I can wipe the database, recreate it from scratch, and run my tests off of that, that makes it a lot easier to produce reproducible results when you're testing. If I have to go against a back end database that's constantly changing and I can't wipe clean, that's called a dirty environment and all sorts of weird things can pop up during the testing process and you have to work around that. So from a very high level, is our testing environment for the back end dirty or clean? As of right now, 
um, what I do is, or what, so what happens is the database gets bootstrapped before any tests are run, but it doesn't get bootstrapped before every test is run. So, um, so yeah, so basically you bootstrap the database, which is a complete empty copy of the database, and then you run the test against that empty copy of the database. That's, that's perfect. That, that's okay. a clean system. That's great. Okay, yeah. so as long as you don't need to be bootstrapped between tests, then we're in good shape. <laughs> No, that, that's fine. That's fine. That'll that'll make it a lot easier to produce, uh, to be reproducible. And to, yeah, there's a lot of code in the tests themselves to populate the database for those tests. But yeah, it, and very easily, but the code is there, assuming there's no code, there's no data in the database at all. That, that's perfect. Thank you. So yeah, that's that's me. Um, so. The rest of today and Monday will be getting this what this API call done. Um, and once that's done, it'll be plugging it into the to the UI stuff I built. So, okay, awesome. Maybe we can get another show and tell next week. Yeah, I'm hoping for it. <laughs> A working one, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Josh, do you have anything to report on? Sure. So. Uh... Well, a couple of things. So I, I printed good closures as quick as the printer will print them, assembling them. I ended up buying a little amp so that I can test them for sound quality and whatnot without having to hook them up to the device. I got on the phone with our friends at Bellina, um, had a meeting with them yesterday. Uh, I've allocated Monday through Wednesday of next week to evaluate the update processes. Uh, the Bellina thing also includes the Wi-Fi update or the Wi-Fi setup uh, and operating system updates. Um, and then they, they foot stomped pretty hard that they're willing to work with us on price. Um, they would value having a big open source community um, using their software. So I'll be looking at that. I'll also be looking at Panticore and then I'll be evaluating Ubuntu are the three that really fell out of it. Um, I've been playing with the Coral chip a little bit, um, not as much as I, I both should and shouldn't. The, I should be playing with it from a familiarization standpoint, but I shouldn't because it's the project I want to apply it to initially is a distraction. So, um, but I have I have at least booted it up and validated that it does provide speed ups for code that is is compiled across to it or for TensorFlow models that are that are um, well, compiled. I guess is probably not the right word, but uh, trained to it. Uh, I don't know what else did I do. I think that pretty well sums it up. I've been oh, and then you know we we're taking apart the patent troll so. Um, we've been having some discussions about that and then fundraising as well, which are both, I guess, separate from the, the dev meeting. Uh, yeah, that's all I have. So by Wednesday of next week, I should have an answer on what makes sense from my perspective if, for updates. Um, you know, I'll ask for some feedback on that. And then, you know, I would, I would suggest that as quickly as possible, especially given that we have hardware coming, we adopt the update process and start pushing updates to our various devices using the official process so that we can brick our own devices internally rather than bricking hundreds or thousands of devices globally. Uh, and, and I did find out that Bolina does have an open source component uh, called Open Bolina that we could use without paying them. But I, I see some significant value in working with a partner who can support us there. And um, they also have a mechanism that allows us to pass chunks of devices off to new administrators, which means that once we sign up a project like Project Rollover and get them configured and get all their devices squared away, we can actually turn administration of those devices as a chunk over to the administrators at that company and then collect um, a monthly fee for helping to administer them. And in that case, the fees, the public fee structure for Bolina makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, that's an interesting feature. Um, all right, thanks. Um, I don't. Oops, I don't have any updates uh, on um, on the development side here. I've been working on business stuff, um, but um, I have, you know, as as a little bit of a, a side project, I've been brushing up on my Python. Uh, so you know, maybe I'll get my my hands dirty one of these days. Um, yeah, that's it for me. So, um, anything else? One other that, thing I wanted to do, I wanted to go back. 
real quick on the on the, the query I'm running. Um, I did want to mention that I am considering performance right now. I mean, I'm considering the actual algorithm, but we're talking about several tables and each of them having millions of rows on them a piece. So um, I am doing my best to consider how the query will perform. Um, you know, not as, not as much, you know, what returns, but not making sure it returns in more than in less than a second, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and once you have all your queries and stuff in place, we can run some explain plans on them and see if we want to add some compound indices and such. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah I just want to make sure that wasn't further than you cared. I mean, I know you were trying to limit what I do first run, but I mean, I can just write something to just return something. And because, <laughs> you know, on the first day, we're not going to have a million, <laughs> but we will have, right. you know, a lot soon. So. I didn't know if that was something we could, you know, if you want me to, to optimize for performance later or, and just get something written that works, or if you want me to optimize for performance now. Uh, I mean, I'll trust your judgment on it. I think you should make note of anything that you think might be an issue down the road and uh, and at what point, you know, we will have to revisit it and re-optimize the performance, right? So, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, trust your judgment as to what level of optimization is appropriate for right now. But, um, you know, imagine that, uh, Every one of our, um, you know, nine thousand contributing uh, members uh, was using the system. You know, would it would it work for them? Right. Um, you can you can do some math and figure out you know what the peak load on a system like that would be, um, and uh, you know scale it appropriately. So. Um, okay. Any any other questions? All right. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh -huh. to hopefully can. Sorry, <laughs> uh, was there's a there's a ticket right there right now assigned to me in the sprint, which is converting um, the existing API call in core to call the new API. Since you're in the VK test, Ken, did you want to tackle that as well so that I can can concentrate on the tagging stuff? Yeah, I, I actually alluded to that. The API call is going to be tricky because that's where you're going to have big delays. In other words, the initial just, hey, did it upload properly or did it throw an error when it should have? It's not a problem. It's the fact that it's not actually going to make its way into the system until midnight that night. How do you test that? Uh, it's uh, possibly not going to get tagged right away. And when it does get tagged, it's you know potentially going to be maybe another 24 hours before it actually technically gets moved. So those are the challenges, but yeah, I was planning on doing all the API tests too. Yeah, not just the tests, but actually the code and core that does the call, making sure that's going to work with. Oh, the code inside of uh, you're talking about in core that posts. Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, all I would do, I assume, is add the uh, authentication, right? Uh, it might be that easy, but I, I just wanted to make sure that was something you were considering. Yeah, I mean, I, I would leave the two fields that you're not using in there so that in heaven forbid in the future you change your mind. They're not going to break anything by being there. Uh, and I would just leave the call as is and add authentication. If you want me to do that, I'll do that. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Just one of the things on my list that, you know, if yeah, you could get no, to. not a problem. Not a problem. Yep. Okay. Um, if you have a ticket for it, if you do, just assign it to me. Okay, I will do that. Um, shoot. And I had something else, but I forgot what it was. Well, if you think about it, you can always send Ken a, uh, a letter. All right. Uh, okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate your time, and uh, always a pleasure. Uh, I, uh, well, we'll uh, have a good weekend, and we will talk again on Monday. Cool. Bye. Okay, can you be on for just a second?